This is Twit. Some of the main creators of Apple's Siri virtual assistant are building what they believe will be a better assistant called Viv. Their startup is called Viv Labs, and journalist and best-selling author Stephen Levy wrote a detailed feature on Viv and the people behind it for Wired and joins us now to talk about it. Welcome, Stephen Levy. Thank you. So glad you're here. Now, let's jump right into this. How is Viv going to be different from Siri? So it, it's like Siri and Cortana and Google Now. It's a voice interface system that uh, answers questions for you and does certain things for you. But what differentiates Viv is that it's going to be open to developers to add their services and businesses and databases in there. Uh, so Viv's creators sort of compare it to uh, the iPhone. When the iPhone first came out, only Apple could approve very few application uh, developers. But then when it opened it up, it had hundreds of thousands. So Viv is going to be this voice assistant that's going to have hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of other businesses and services and databases open to it for one big global brain, as its uh, inventors describe it. Hey, Stephen, can you tell us a little bit about the roadmap here? When do developers actually get to uh, work with this platform? And then when do uh, end users like me potentially get to see it and, and, and work with it? So right now for the prototype, they only used a very few because they've been trying to be stealth. Uh, mm -hmm. With their publication of my story in the September issue of Wire that went online today, they're going to start approaching them, uh, you know, can bigger numbers there uh, to try to get the critical mass they're looking for. So that's really, that getting developers really starts today. Uh, and in terms of when you'll see it, I think sometime next year. Now, of course, they're throwing around language like the self-learning sort of always grows and learns with you. This sounds to me a lot like Samantha in the movie Her. It's not going to be really like that. Is it? It's not going to be self-learning in that sense. It'll be self-learning in terms of gaining new sources of data and just using personal information that's available to it in order to be intelligent. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not going to uh, hook up with you in, in the romantic sense. But what it will do, at least the, as the ambitions are, is that it's going to learn how to fulfill your requests better. So if you could say something cryptic, it might know really what you mean. One thing they said to me is, for instance, uh, they assume that in the future you're going to be able at two in the morning, stand outside a bar and say to your phone, I'm drunk. And it'll know who you are, where you are, uh, where you live, dispatch a car you know, to you because it knows that when you say I'm drunk at two in the morning, you probably want to ride home. Hey, Stephen, can, can you give us some more color commentary on the people behind this? I mean, were these low-level folks over at Siri, or was this the core team from Siri that's working on this now? These are the people who invented Siri. Uh, probably the key guy is named Adam Chire. Uh, he was the fellow at Stanford Research Institute, SRI, that uh, did this $400 million project uh, for DARPA. He was the lead de uh, developer on that, called Kalo, which really broke new ground in artificial intelligence assistance. Uh, and that became the core of Siri when he met up with um, uh, Dag Kitlaus, uh, who had left his job at Motorola and became an entrepreneur in residence at SRI and convinced him to start a company together. Uh, there was a third Siri co-founder that went with them to Apple, uh, who's still at Apple, Tom Gruber. But uh, the third co-founder of was another engineer uh, originally at SRI, then Apple, well, Chris Brigham. Brigham. So the really key people behind Siri uh, left Apple and now have this startup to take uh, voice-activated assistance uh, to the next level. Adam Cherrier is a super genius, and he's been trying to build what you're describing here for a long time. And it sounds to me like that's was the original intention behind Siri. It was supposed to be much more plugged into all kinds of other services. And I recall using Siri when it was just an app before Apple bought it, and it was already making restaurant reservations, and they were promising all kinds of other integrations. As soon as Apple got their hands on it, they backed off on those integrations, and they're talking about, you know, we're hearing uh, rumors that they're going to be slowly rolling out additional integrations in the future. But really, he's been trying to build this kind of thing for many years, hasn't he? That's right. Yeah, and you 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 said it. Uh, when Siri, the application, 
came out. It was only out for a few months before Steve Jobs personally uh, made a pitch for uh, the Siri team to join Apple. Uh, they had uh, over 40 things that you could do with it. Uh, now, slowly, Apple's been adding some of those back. For instance, the original Siri, you can make a movie reservation. You could do that now with the Apple Siri. But what the, the, the big secret sauce of Viv is that in order to add things, you don't really need engineers in-house to do the additions. It's open, so the uh, uh, services themselves can, with uh, they say as little as a few hours of training, can add their service to this global brain that is Viv. And the you know, uh, and when you make a request that might involve that service, where that service might be able to satisfy you, then Viv will itself will write the code automatically to make that link. Uh, between you know uh, one database and another, so it could fulfill a very complicated request. One last question, Stephen. This is, um, you know, this is going to be cross-platform. Apparently, what is the business model? How are they going to sell this? Is this going to go straight to consumers? Or are they going to go to companies that would integrate this into their products? I think uh, the plan is, though it's not in stone, is that they will get a cut of all the transactions you want. So when you say I'm drunk and the car picks you up, uh, they'll get a cut of, of that Uber service or whatever it is. Um, if you say, I want to buy a bottle of wine on the way to my brother's house that goes well with lasagna, uh, it can do that for you. That's the example they gave me. And we talk about it in depth in the story in Wired. Uh, but they'll get a cut of that purchase of wine. So I think it's an affiliate uh, you know, uh, purchase. It's the logical business model for them. Yeah, your example of the a wine that's, near, you know, find me the nearest bottle of wine that pairs well with a specific dish. That feels a little bit like Wolfram Alpha type of calculation. There's, there seems to be bits of Google Now, bits of Siri, and presumably bits of Cortana in this in terms of feature sets. It sounds really intriguing, and uh, I congratulate you on this exclusive. It's really, really an interesting article. Everybody needs to go to Wired.com and read this article. Now, Stephen Levy, when you wrote this, you were, uh, you were the senior writer for Wired, but that is no longer true, is it? No, actually, uh, uh, last Friday was my last day at Wired. I actually have one more story coming out. We have long lead times. So this is the September issue. I have one coming out in the October issue. But um, I recently took a, a job at Medium. My job is to, to build a tech site uh, within that fantastic, beautiful platform at Medium. So I've become a startup guy myself. That's incredible. Now, Stephen Levy is a former writer for Wired and the author of numerous best-selling books, including In the Plex, which is about Google, and also Insanely Great, which is about the Macintosh. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephen Levy. My pleasure. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. You too.